If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, would you open them with me uh, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And Janet, you can skip that slide that says it's a pace, placeholder. So I'm looking at the notes up there, and I made this presentation at home, and I said there's a placeholder for the sermon text, so you can just skip right to the sermon text. So Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. This is such a familiar passage, and, and sometimes I think the temptation is when we have familiar passages, we just kind of coast a little bit. So engage with me in God's Word. And let's look together to see what God would have to say to us together this morning. So beginning at verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6, the word of God says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, forsake, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head with oil and, and, and wash your face. That your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful that you have called us to be a part of your kingdom. And Lord, we come in this moment asking that you would speak to us through your word, that you would give us wisdom, not just to fill our minds with knowledge, but a wisdom that will stir our hearts toward obedience and that will help us live in this kingdom of yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, last week as I was introducing this message to this series, I talked about those moments that kind of shake us and reminding you that God in his perfection has never had one of those moments. And he's called us to live in his kingdom, and his kingdom is unshakable. The purposes of God are never thwarted, and we live under the reign and the rule of King Jesus, who's called us to live for, and for him and join in his work in this kingdom. So it's an already and a not yet. And so there we find Jesus. When he's teaching his disciples to pray. This then is how you should pray. And did you notice where he, where he went quickly after praise to God? He says, your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. It's, it's interesting that there's Jesus who's inaugurating, who's bringing in, who's ushering in the very kingdom, teaches us to pray and praise himself, God, your kingdom come. Now, I, I want you to know, over the next few weeks, last week we looked a little bit about what the kingdom is like. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how do we live in the kingdom. And, and how do we live in such a way that the kingdom is here and now and present. And I want you to hear from the very beginning, a key component of that is the way we pray. And by the way, this Friday and Saturday, we're going to have an incredible opportunity right here in this building, in this room, to hear from a gentleman that God has blessed in unique ways, Don Whitney. Dr. Whitney has written an incredible book about praying the Bible. 
I've talked about it myself, about how it really shaped and changed the way I pray, especially as I read through the Psalms and Proverbs. But I, I think we often can get in this kind of rote routine of the way we pray. Maybe it's at meal times, or maybe it's at bedtime, or maybe it's a certain times of day, and you kind of get in your mind that now's the time I need to pray, and if you were to take and play back a recording of your prayers, they might all sound the same. But as Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, it's not that we necessarily need to pray these words, but we certainly need to have these focuses on our heart and our mind. And friends, prayer should have a kingdom focus. When you and I pray, we should be focused on the kingdom. And and let me try to give some practical expression to this. We pray for people that don't feel well, that are sick. Uh, I, I heard somebody call our, our Wednesday night prayer service years ago the uh, arthritis and knees service. You know, we're, we're just praying for all the sick and afflicted. And maybe you grew up and you heard that. We're praying for the sick and afflicted. Now, I don't mean to say you don't need to be praying for those who are sick and suffering. But could I challenge you that even in your prayer for them, it be focused towards the kingdom. It might sound a little bit like this. God, Matt's really suffering right now. He's having to listen to his pastor's sermon, but I pray that he would have patience in this season. Now, I'm picking on Matt a little bit. But as you're praying for people who are sick or ill, pray for the Spirit to move in their life. Pray for the fruit of the Spirit to be evidenced. Pray that they would know and recognize His grace and pray that as they experience a time of affliction and they need healing and they need strength that they would recognize all that comes from God. Friends, you and I, when we pray, our prayer should be kingdom focused. And I don't know about you, but I know plainly from this text Kingdom-focused prayer is so intricately related to what he says next. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I know we're talking about a sovereign God who controls all things. And I know we could probably get into some deep theological conversations about, well, does anything happen that's not God's will? This is what I'm, I'm I'm not talking about those kind of deep theological conversations. If I hear Jesus say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we know that the kingdom and the will of God are inseparable. So if, if we were to take a look at what it is that God desires and what he wants, then that informs the way we pray and the way we live in this world. And here's something that I know scripture says in 2 Timothy. It is God's desire that all should be saved and come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, friends, it it is God's will that people come to saving faith in Jesus. So that not only should inform the way we pray, but it should inform the way we live. You and I have a message that's been delivered to us if we are in Christ, and this is the message. Although we were far from God, and although we were, there was never any hope of us living perfect or good enough to reach to God, God in his great mercy was gracious to send Jesus, who lived a sinless life and died a sinner's death, that we might have a relationship with God. And, and friends, if it's the desire of God that all would would come to saving faith in Christ, then don't you think you and I and our kingdom-focused praying and our kingdom-focused living should be seeking to share Christ with as many as we can. To give people an opportunity to hear the good news and respond to the gospel of our Lord and Savior. Well, I, I, I don't know. Were you up late watching the Cowboys game? Is that the problem? Is that what it was? Is that, is that why you're a little down this morning? I mean, the Sooners and the Cowboys both won, so everybody ought to be happy this morning. 
I said that we should be in doing all that we can to share the good news of the gospel with all that we meet. Amen. We have a burden and a message on our heart because God has saved us, redeemed us, called it as his own, and it's not a message that we can keep bottled up. It's not something that we can just... Here, here's what I want to say. Friends, God saved you, and you ought not ever get to a point where you get over that fact. It ought to be something that you just never get over. You wake up every day and say, I can't believe God has saved me. He's called me to be his own. That I have this good news that I can share with everyone. This is what it looks like to see the kingdom of God coming in this world. Because we know that the will of God and the kingdom are inseparable. And so God is looking to make his name great. He's looking to receive the glory that's due his name. Do you know the, how that happens? When people see the goodness and the glory of Jesus. And, and, and in, in such, it's God's will that you would look more like, Christ, more like Jesus. It's conversion and it's commitment. I mean, the, the kingdom is conversion and commitment. Did you see the way that Jesus immediately moved from prayer to teaching? He said, you should, you should pray. And you should pray for the kingdom and you should pray about the forgiveness that you have and the way you've forgiven others. But then immediately he just goes into this message about how we are to forgive others. And about how we're to have discipline in our lives. And how we're to live in, in fasting and praying. Friends, God's will is that you would look more like Jesus. Philippians 1.6, Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. And, and he looks at those believers and he says to them, under all the inspiration of the Spirit, that I want you to be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. Do you realize that that God has saved you, he's redeemed you, he's called you to be his own, and he will never stop working in your life till you look more like Christ. So that when we come to that great day when the Lord returns or he calls us home, we will be in the presence of God and we will feel at home. That's a thought that really takes a lot to consider. Every single person that encountered God in Scripture, you would hear this phrase, fear not, don't be afraid. But there will be a day, friends, when you and I, either pastor in this life or the Lord himself comes and returns and we're in his presence and we will feel at home in the holiness and the majesty and the glory of God. And, and Jesus even said, this is eternal life, that they know me. Do you realize that it's God's will that your life more, look more like Jesus, and part of living in, the, in eternity is getting to know him more and loving him more in the here and in the now. And, and the reality is, as we live in the kingdom, and as we want to see the kingdom come, and we're praying for that, and we're sharing the good news of Jesus, and the will of God is not separated from the kingdom. It is all in one. Friends, as much as you want to, you cannot advance the kingdom and have an unforgiving heart. And I know, I know that Jesus mentioned this so many times. Even in the Sermon on the Mount where we're looking in this text in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. He he comes a little bit later and he's talking about the way that we judge one another. And and he says, folks, you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and never think to remove the plank that's sticking out of your own. And I believe that when we have a condemning and a judgmental heart or spirit towards others, it's this grotesque plank that sticks out of our eye. 
And sometimes it causes an unbelieving world to look at the church and to look at Christians and say, you know what, they're just a bunch of... Yeah, I didn't need to put that point on the screen. You got it. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. And and friends, if we have an angry, embittered heart and spirit towards the lost or towards others, or, God forbid even one another in the body of Christ, we will not advance the kingdom. One of the things I love about what God has been doing at First Baptist Church in Duncan, Oklahoma, is that there are so many people who are lovingly, graciously, and joyfully accepting and inviting everyone that comes in. There's a spirit of love and joy and genuineness that that only comes from the Spirit of God moving among the people of God. And while I see that and I appreciate it, I wonder if somewhere, in some way, there aren't some of us that say, well, I hope... X, Y, or Z never walks through the doors of this church. Because I've got a grudge against them. I've got, I've got issues with the way they live their life. Or the way... If, if you have an unforgiving heart, you will never advance the kingdom of God. Jesus used some pretty radical words here. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me tell you just plainly what forgiveness entails. From a human perspective, it's not forgive and forget as God does. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. But but forgiveness in our part is saying this. I no longer hold judgment over you. I no longer am the one who condemns you for your action. That's forgiven. I forgive it. And here's why Jesus, I think, uses such harsh language. Because if you choose in your heart to not forgive someone, do you know what you're saying in essence? God, my will and my place of judgment is much greater than yours ever will be. God, I know what these people deserve. I know what they've done. And I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to let go until their judgment is final by me. And do you know what that leads to in your life? bitterness and I think you've heard this before bitterness is drinking the poison that you think is going to kill somebody else all an unforgiving heart will do is make you a bitter contemptuous and unloving person and and if God desires holiness in our lives he desires us to look like Christ then how can we say God, I thank you that you've forgiven me. But what they've done to me is unforgivable. If God had the same spirit that some of us possess, there'd be no chance any of us would see the splendor and the glory and the majesty of heaven. So so Jesus is calling us to be a part of this kingdom and live in this kingdom. And part of living in that kingdom is praying for the kingdom and sharing the good news. But part of that kingdom is the way you and I live in the here and now. And part of that has got to say, God, if you've saved me, if you've forgiven me, then in your strength and in your grace, help me to be kind and compassionate and forgiving to others. And strangely enough, strangely enough, he moves from an unforgiving heart to not eating food. 
And, and, and maybe that's just a, a crude way of saying it, but he talks about fasting. And, and we're going to be more apt to talk about the next potluck than the next season of fasting in the church. So, and, and I don't say that to condemn us, but I say that to say sometimes spiritual disciplines are something that we say, oh, that's for the religious people. That's for the super spiritual person. That, that's for somebody else. It's not for me. The spiritual growth conference that's going to take place in the building, that, that's for people that really got it together. I mean, I'm, I, that's not me. I'm not that person. I, I think what Jesus is, is moving to when he's talking about the kingdom, he, he's really saying this truth plainly and clearly. Advancing the kingdom demands a spiritually disciplined life. You and I will not see the kingdom advance just by sitting back and saying, God, do your thing. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad God saved me and look at what he's going to do next. Now, God gave the great commission, the great commandment to, to you and to me. We're to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus had commanded and that's the reason he will be with us to the very end of the age. It requires work from you and from me. And this work, by the way, that Jesus is talking about, in particular fasting and praying, goes right back to what he said the way that we should pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you want to, want to know one of the great benefits of fasting? When you fast, when you forsake food and you say, God, you are what I need more than the food. I need you. And you're taking time that you'd normally be eating and you're devoting it to seeking the face of God and hearing from him. You begin to discern spiritual realities. I, I believe you begin to see and to know and discern the heart and the will of God. And you understand where you need to be working and what you need to be doing in life. Advancing the kingdom demands a spiritually disciplined life. And being and growing and becoming more like Christ is not like aging where you just suddenly grow up. The sanctification that God works in your life demands passages like Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. And the problem with living sacrifices is they often crawl off the altar. But when you're on that altar and you're surrendered, then you will be able to know, then you will be able to discern and understand what is the will of God, that which is perfect and good. You see, at some level, when we're engaging in spiritual disciplines, and we're saying, I, I want to belong to the kingdom, I want all of me to be all for Christ, that's us joining in the kingdom work. But advancing the kingdom demands participation in kingdom work. And, and, and I say that because Jesus moves on to talk about not laying up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. He's talking about a physical participation and a spiritual reality. And I think this is the way that works. God owns all of you in Christ. We were once slaves to sin. Now we are slaves to Christ. So our time, our talent, our treasure, it's God's. We steward all of it. We portion out our time. We portion out our talents. We portion out our treasures in ways that will bring honor and glory to God. But kingdom advancement demands participation in kingdom work. So if the only time you interact with the church is when the church is gathered in this room, in this hour, there is some participation in the worship and the corporate experience 
But friends, God, God wants your participation of your talents and of your treasures. He, he wants you to be all in with all that he is doing. And, and some of that is saying, you know, I've visited long enough. I want to place my membership here because I want people to know that I'm committed to Christ. I'm committed to the body and I want brothers and sisters that will come alongside and encourage me and call me to faithfulness. Participation may look like going and serving on Sunday mornings and, Sunday, uh, and Wednesday nights in the nursery or the preschool or the children's department. If Amanda hasn't met you yet, she will soon, and she will want you to work with the kiddos. And you're going to love her so much, you're going to say, oh, I can't wait to work with the kiddos. But we've been asking for people to work and serve in our nursery and our preschool areas, and we need participation in kingdom work. Do you know what happens when we have a full nursery and preschool? You know what happens when we have a robust children's ministry? We have families that are present and engaged. But it's, it's going to take some people to say, that have been saying, I've done my part. I've served my time. That season of life is over. To reconsider and say, well, maybe I could give some time. Maybe I could participate in some way. But, but the real emphasis of what Jesus is saying here when he's talking about treasure is our financial partnership. Our financial investment in the kingdom. And let me be as plain as I can be. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. All that we do as a church family is because of your generosity and your faithfulness to the Lord. And, and it sounds quite strange for the pastor to say it, but we don't need your money. If you think that somehow you can just come in and write a big check and you and God and everything's okay, we don't need your money. And God has enough resources He can provide in so many ways, but God desires your heart. And, and notice the way that Jesus says that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If all your treasure is tied up in a 401k or a stock investment, you'll be watching that market like a hawk. If all your treasure is sunk into a real estate investment, you're going to want to know how it's performing and looking at it carefully. But if you've poured your treasure into the kingdom of God, you're going to want to be an active participant. You're going to want to see and do all that you can do. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And friends, ultimately, being a part of the kingdom of God being called to his unshakable kingdom is that very thing. We, we began by talking about conversion, that, that God wants people to come to saving faith in Christ. And here's the simplest way I can put it. Same way I said it there, God desires your heart. You see, there is a season in my life where I knew all the right things in my head about God. But somehow, God began to convict my own heart. I was living for myself. I was living for pleasure. I was living to make something and be somebody someday through pursuing a, a higher education. But God got a hold of my life, and all these things that I knew in my head about God came into my heart. And... Salvation is surrendering your heart and your life to say, Jesus, you are my all in all. I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live for you. And the way that you do that is you turn from a previous way of living. The Bible says that that's sin. Every mark, every attempt that we make to live up to the holiness of God, we fail. Sometimes we think we're headed in the godly direction, but if we are to search our heart, we know we'll never live up to the holiness and the perfection of Christ. So 
Turning to Christ is turning away from sin and saying, God, I come to you with all that I am, trusting that you and you alone can save me through what Jesus has done. And maybe somebody this morning, maybe someone in this room or watching online, you're ready to give your heart and your life to Christ. You, you know that you're, you're tired of living the way you've lived for so long. Maybe feeling it some way that you've been stretching and straining and you find yourself failing over and over again. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God has demonstrated his own love toward you in this while you are still a sinner. Christ died for you. So maybe in a moment when we stand and when we sing a song of response, the cry of your heart is going to be something like this. God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Come and give me new life. But it may be in a moment when we begin to respond to God and his word that you need to be a person that's committed to pray for the kingdom. That you need to be a person who's sharing the good news of Christ. Or that you recognize you need to be more disciplined in your life that you would know Christ and be like him. Or that you need to give your time, talent, and treasures to be more like Christ and to live to see his kingdom advanced. Or it may be that on this day is the day you finally say, God, you've forgiven me so much. I want to let go of the hurt and the pain that other people have caused. And let go of bitterness and anger and resentment and truly begin to forgive. And say, God, you know about all these things. And you and your judgment and your discernment is so much clearer than mine. I release that and give it back to you. But would you join me in praying and asking God to let his kingdom move and grow among us. Father, I'm so thankful that you've called us to be a part of your unshakable kingdom. That, that in Jesus we have life and we have wholeness. God, I pray for someone in, in the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus, that maybe this day would be the day that they would cry out to you. So God, help them even in this moment to say, Jesus, I need you. I turn from my sin and I rest in the finished work of the cross. God, thank you for a church family that helps us to be focused and be kingdom oriented. And God, in... in, in your strength and in your power may we move to proclaim the good news of Jesus to others God if there's someone here this morning struggling with an unforgiving heart and spirit I pray that even in these moments their heart would be broken over all that you've forgiven them and that they would rest in your wisdom and in your goodness and in your kindness and let go of bitterness and resentment and anger and that they might know a forgiveness in their heart that has come from you in Jesus name I pray amen